If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a true democracy and a just society. I'm your host, David Delk. Our program today will consist of video recorded on August 16th here in Portland of a presentation by author Clara Connor. She has authored Wrapped in the Flag, A Personal History of American's Radical Right. This is based on her personal history of being the daughter of two very early members of the John Birch Society. She points out the continuing influence of the ideas of the John Birch Society in the Tea Party movement of today and the need for liberal America to unite in the ongoing battle against our common enemy, the radical right. In the 1960s, the John Birch Society was the most effective, best funded, largest radical right-wing organization in the history of America. Now, it wasn't the first radical right-wing organization, and it obviously has not been the last. But the John Birch Society did something that no one else had done before. The founder of the John Birch Society figured out how to get a whole group of people all across the country doing the same thing at the same time. In other words, he developed political activism on the right, populist political activism. He did this by a top-down authoritarian approach. In fact, he said, Robert Welsh said, this will always be a monolithic organization. There is no place for democracy in this society. Interesting, isn't that? No place for democracy in the organization. You do have to question what kind of country those folks would run. And my father used to say all the time, there is no place for democracy. It's too messy. It's mob rule. It's all the things that you can't have if you're actually going to change something. So one of the very first programs of the John Birch Society is one that some of you, I'm sure, recognize. It was called, this is a republic, not a democracy. Let's keep it that way. So I learned that slogan when I was a little, you know, 12 years old. And it was years before I realized what it meant. Absolutely years. It was kind of the, one of the clues that I had that in fact, what I believed about government was not what my parents believed. Because oddly enough, even as a kid, I thought everyone ought to be able to vote. Whether you were a man, a woman, African-American, an immigrant, a cit any citizen should be able to vote once you reach, obviously, the age of majority. So I couldn't understand in a republic, everybody doesn't vote. That's one of the key differences between a democracy and a republic. So my dad used to talk about the fact that one of the things that had to happen is the 17th Amendment had to go. We could not have the direct election of senators. Now. I'm sure, up, I hope up here in the Pacific Northwest, you don't hear a lot of talk about that. But where I live, you have people running for the Senate saying, I do not believe in the direct election of senators. What amazes me is people vote for them. They do. So you're voting for someone who's going to take away your right to vote for him. I know, it sort of makes your head spin around, doesn't it? So, when the John Birch Society was founded in 1958, it had two tasks. It set itself two tasks. The first one was to defeat the communists. Now, that international conspiracy of communists, as far as the John Birch Society was concerned, they were not only coming, they were here. They were here. So one of the tasks that we had was to discover, name, and out the secret communists 
in our neighborhoods. So we had this whole project that we did where we took our index cards and we wrote down the names of people who we thought might be secret communists and they, we sent them to Belmont, Massachusetts, which was the headquarters, and I guess they sorted them. I don't know, I was keep thinking about the teachers I didn't like and the priest who wasn't, you know, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but that's what they were doing. So they, the John Birch Society believed that there were these secret communists in the United States who were going to emerge at the moment when the United States was being fused into the Soviet Union. So that was kind of a scary kind of thing, you know. That we're talking the 1950s here. The communists were coming. They were marching across Europe, Eastern Europe. It was a scary time. And that fear worked very, very well. People are afraid. They put down their money. They sign up. But that wasn't enough for the Birchers. It wasn't enough just to find the communists and out them. We had another task, and this is the significant task for today. The John Birch Society believed that the federal government had to be cut by 70% of its current size in 1960. So 70% of what the federal government did had to go. So we'll think about what that means. That meant Social Security, right off the bat, was done. Anything that had to do with unemployment, aiding the poor, feeding people in need, any sort of what we now call the social safety net, the John Birch Society opposed in 1958, and newsflash, they oppose it today. Now, in addition to that, my father and his John Birch friends did not believe in such things as the highway department. They did not believe that the federal government should build highways. They did not believe that the federal government had any right whatsoever to interfere with the Jim Crow laws in the South. They did not believe that the federal government could do anything about civil rights. They didn't believe in any impact of the federal government on education. All regulation was out the window. My dad didn't even believe in the regulation of nuclear weapons. Because, here's the, here's the kicker, the theory was this, the federal government is by its nature evil. Not just incompetent or too big or, no, evil. Thus, in order to rid ourselves of this evil monster that we call the federal government, everything it did had to be either dismantled or privatized. So today, when you listen, say for instance, if you live in Florida, we're frant they're frantically trying to privatize all the prisons. They're privatizing the public schools all over the United States in states that are dominated by bright red legislatures. And they are diverting public school funds into charter schools, killing the public schools. That is privatizing those schools. That's what they believe. Now, in my book, I tell the story of what it was like to grow up in this radical right-wing family, which, of course, at first, I didn't know it was a radical right-wing family. It was my family. It was my family. My dad met Robert Welsh in 1955, three years before the John Birch Society was founded, and they immediately became friends. The minute the John Birch Society came to be, my dad signed up. He was num member number one in the city of Chicago, and my mother was member number two. They, they handed over a check for $2,000 for two life memberships. In 1959, $2,000, that would be like about $12,000 today. Now, during those early years, everything that we did, everything in our family was about birching. We actually, I always say, the Connor kid, the Connors did two things. We went to church on Sunday, and we John birched the rest of the week. Many, many times we had six meetings a week in our house. In addition, my father brought home all kinds of friends. All these Birch leaders came to dinner. When they were in Chicago, they always came to the Connors. Many times they stayed overnight. So because of that, actually it was because of those people who came that I had my first moments where I thought, 
hmm, I don't know about this. And the very first, I want to tell you a couple of those stories so you know how I moved away from this. The first thing that struck me was this fella who came to dinner whose name was Revelo Oliver. Revelo Oliver was a full classics professor tenured at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Now before I met this man, my father had told me about what went on in my neighborhood and what went on in Germany in World War II. I lived in a neighborhood which we sort of laughingly said had mostly Jews and a couple of Catholics. And my Jewish neighbors talked about things that happened during the war. I was little, I was six. I didn't fully understand what they were telling me, but I heard about ashes and smoke and I knew people who had numbers on their arms. And I knew that something awful, something terrible had happened. And the woman behind our house, the woman in the next street, whose name was Mrs. Fishman, told me how her family was all gone. There was no family left in Germany. Now, in those years, we didn't talk about the Holocaust in the same way that we do now. It was a hushed thing. It was still such a raw wound. And my father told me about the GIs who freed the camps and how they found bodies stacked like cord wood. So I knew about the Holocaust as well as I knew my name and I knew that President Eisenhower had saved me from speaking German and saved the Jews from total annihilation. I knew those things. Then Revelo Oliver came to dinner. And suddenly, my parents are saying, well, you know, the people who died weren't really, it wasn't because they were Jews, it's because they were communists. And there really isn't any proof that there were any, there were no bodies. There really isn't any proof that they were cremated and gassed. And my father started talking about Germans as if they were following orders. They were just military men following orders. Revelo Oliver is the father of the neo-Nazi movement in the United States. If you Google him today, you can read the most revolting pieces of writing ever that I've ever encountered. He coined the term hollow hoax. That was his term. And the neo-Nazis tip their hat to him as their great leader. He was on the National Council of the John Birch Society with my dad. After I listened to Rebel Oliver a few times in my living room, I thought my mother and dad had lost their minds and that Revelo Oliver had helped them. That was the first time I doubted my dad. Then, in high school, in 19, I was in high school, I graduated in 1963, so I started high school in 59, graduated in 63. My father announced that he had no money, and thus I had to figure out how to pay for my own schooling. Now, he picked the school I had to go to, and then told me I had to pay for it. It was quite a situation. Anyway, I got a job at the Greyhound bus station in downtown Chicago at Clark and Randolph. And it was the first time I actually worked with African Americans, you know, tattooed guys who drove motor motorcycles. It was quite an amazing experience for me. I gave information on the phone. So people would call me up in the middle of the night, having had a bit too much to drink, and ask me how they could go from Colorado Springs to Milwaukee to, you know, Sarasota, Florida. I mean, okay. It was really an amazing job. Now, what it did do for me is it paid for my college because it was a union job. It was a union job. And it paid $2.47 an hour. That was the highest paying job for women in the city of Chicago in 1962. How about that? Anyway, so in the, summer of, in the summer of 1963, before I left for college, that was the great period of the civil rights movement. People were marching, sitting in, standing tall for civil rights. And oddly enough, for a white kid, I always say, I say in my book, what I knew about African Americans, I could write on the palm of one hand. But I had a teacher who gave me a book. She said, I want you to read this book. And it was Black Like Me. That book, to this day, I get shivers when I talk about that book. Because never in my life had I ever considered 
that someone, an American, who happened to have black skin would not be able to find a bathroom in the South. Or that you'd be traveling with your children and be unable to get a Coca-Cola. I couldn't grasp that before then. It was like stunning to me. So while I was having the beginnings of this evolution and came to understand that one of my core beliefs was that everybody deserved the, deserved the same rights I had. That was simple for me. I didn't really even put it necessarily in terms of race at that time. I just said, everybody should be treated the way I am. So while that was going on, my parents were absolutely on fire that Martin Luther King was a communist. The John Birch Society made their bones in the South when they aligned with the White Citizens Councils and the KKK. That's the people who were coming to dinner at my house. I heard Dr. Martin Luther King give the I Have a Dream speech. Quite by accident, I flipped on the TV in my basement in Chicago. My parents were out of town. I had heard that Dr. King was a communist, a thug, a revolutionary, a dangerous man. I had heard everything, but I'd never heard him. I remember what I was wearing. I remember what I was eating. I remember that day like it was yesterday. And I was so taken by his talk that when he finished speaking, I realized I was crying. And I'm sure you've seen the films. When the throng of people started singing We Shall Overcome, a song I had never known before. Here I am in my basement singing along. Civil rights was the second reason I left the right wing. Because I couldn't understand. But here's what I did know. The John Birch Society, which had sort of been kicked out of the GOP for calling President Eisenhower a communist, the, the right wing had gone to the south and they were making tremendous growth in the south. In 1965, in Birmingham, Alabama, get this, there were 100 John Birch Society chapters in Birmingham in 1965. In 1965 in Chicago, there were 25. That's a wow. That is a real wow for me, and not in a good way. To this day, the John Birch Society is part and parcel of, limiting, of, of this whole business about voter ID and limiting the franchise and all of that nonsense that the right wing is peddling. Because they don't believe that people of color or people who tend to vote for, gasp, Democrats, ought really to be voting at all. And that's what that comes down to. So those were the first two issues that drove me out of the right. The final one, oddly enough, was the right to life movement. Because after I had told my parents, I will play no more with your politics, I joined the right to life movement. I was a speaker for, I was in the movement for 12 years. I was a speaker for Wisconsin. I was on the board of Wisconsin Right to Life. I did it all. And you can read the whole story of how that happened. I was a good Catholic girl with, young, with little babies at home. And I believed absolutely that abortion was a bad choice and that we had to provide those things that every woman needed so she could carry her babies to term. It was that simple for me. I thought, you feed them, you educate, you have birth control, you have daycare, all of those things must be done. And I thought everyone else believed me, believed me on that point. I thought every single person who called themselves pro-life would agree. And then in 1976, I discovered maybe I was wrong. I went to my house to see my mother, and we were talking about pro-life. And while they were disgusted with me for being a bleeding heart liberal in every other respect, they liked the fact that I was a pro-life leader. 
So we were having this conversation. And I said, you know, they're trying to cut, um, it was called Women, Infants, and Children in Wisconsin. It was food stamps, basically. It was food support for women in need. Okay, so the Wisconsin legislature is trying to cut this, and I'm down there raising all kinds of cane in Madison. And I said to Mom, this is a terrible thing. No matter what we think about what our government should do, they must do this. They must not take food from women and children and infants. My mother looked at me and said, oh my God, you really are a bleeding heart liberal. No, you're wrong, and I am not participating. So I was at first going, this is my mother, this is my dad. Well, then I found out that, in fact, the whole doggone right to life movement was pretty much in the same place. I mean, to realize that in the United States of America, you could sort of paste this label pro-life on you. You could be pro-war, pro-nuclear bombs, you could be in favor of taking food away from needy people. You could be against taking care of the environment. You could be in, in favor of the death penalty. And you could still run around with this cotton pick and shoes life bumper sticker. And every right winger and every Republican in the whole country would line up and vote for you. And then it, I realized that all of these people who we were endorsing, you know, the right to life endorses like crazy. I looked around and said, how come every one of these people is a Republican man? And I quit. I quit. It was the cause of my life. And I realized it is a fraud. Now, I want to just tell you one more thing, and then we're going to have a chance to talk, I hope. The John Birch Society, is very, it's very easy to laugh at these folks. It really is easy. I mean, you know, you turn on the television, and you see some crackpot with a Revolutionary War hat and tea bags waving the Constitution with some sign that says, you know, President Obama is a socialist, fascist, Marxist, terrorist, African chieftain from Kenya and every other word is misspelled. So we're all laughing, tee hee hee, these people are fools. These people are fools. I'm here to tell you we need to stop laughing. That guy with the sign that everybody copies and pastes on Facebook isn't the story. It's sort of like if you look at an army marching to battle and the drummer boy at the front is offbeat and you go, ha! Oh, they can't do any harm. Look at the drummer. You're not looking in the right place. This is the most funded, planned, and marvelously executed revolution, I will use that word, that's ever occurred in this country. We are already, in my opinion, in a civil war. It's a civil war of policy. And it's being fought in state legislatures across the country. We have 30 bright red state legislators. 30, three-fifths of the United States is now governed by people who could be at my mother and dad's dinner table. And one-third of our government has a chokehold on the whole cotton-picking thing. I heard John Boehner the other night, the other day on one of those Sunday talk shows. It's sort of my rule not to watch them, but I actually accidentally saw him. And he's going, oh, you know, don't judge us on the laws we pass. Judge us on the laws we repeal. And all I could say is, send the man a John Birch Society membership card. That is exactly what they wanted to do in, when I was a kid. And they're doing it now. My father used to say, the very best thing that can ever happen is the day that nothing happens in Washington. They want to stop the government. Before they can shrink it or kill it or change it, they have to stop it and they have to convince us that the thing is broken. 
I always tell every group I talk to, but especially when I talk to kids, don't sit there telling me the government is broken. Our system isn't broken. The people in power are doing this on purpose. So I'm reminded of P.J. O'Rourke, you know, who's a libertarian comedian, and I disagree with practically everything P.J. O'Rourke has ever said, but he is funny. But he said this. He said, the Republicans run on the principle that government doesn't work. And then they get elected and prove it. They do. And so then what happens? Now, I live in a place where I know what happens because the right wing is having a field day in Florida. So then they come back to their constituents and say, see, it is broken because of those liberals with their liberal media, blah, 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 and health care. So we need more Republicans. That's how it works. That's how it works. So today, what the, I think the message I want to leave you with before I take questions is this. I know that right-wing extremism broke my family. And I don't want it to break my country. Thank you. We've been watching a video of Claire Connor, author of Wrapped in the Flag, A Personal History of America's Radical Right. That book is available now at bookstores across the nation. Alliance for Democracy is teaming up with Community Rights Portland to bring Tom Lindsay to Portland for two events. Thomas is the founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which has been instrumental in enacting community rights ordinances in rural communities in Pennsylvania to ban specific corporate abuses in those local communities. The largest of these was a recent ban on fracking enacted by the city of Pittsburgh. Thomas is scheduled to be in Portland on September 21st at Portland State University, where he, where he will talk about creating a safe and local food system, in part by banning the use of GMOs in agriculture. His second event is sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy and will take place on Sunday, September 22nd, at the First Unitarian Church in downtown Portland. His topic will be, why not local democracy? Thank you to Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, and Janet Morris for volunteering their time for getting us on the air, and to all of you for watching. Thank you. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me